Uh, let's get to the more exciting part, which is um, our guest today, George Arias. So um, George, I'm just gonna put you into speaker here or into spotlight for one second, just so everyone can see you. Uh, welcome and, uh, and thanks for coming on. Hey Shane, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to go back and kind of talk to uh, you know, people in Japan. Uh, you know, it, it's been such a blessing that uh, I had the opportunity to play there. So again, um, you know, hopefully I get some questions and I can get some, give you guys some answers and you know, have some fun today. Awesome. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, so for those of you who aren't aware, I'm just going to give the, the long form intro of your background so uh, everyone can hear, uh, hear your story. So um, George is a native of Tucson, Arizona. It's where he's joining us from today. Uh, he played baseball there at Pueblo High School, then became a big prospect at Pima Community College and then at the U of A. Um, he was actually drafted three times in the MLB draft eventually signing with the Angels in, in 93. Um, he advanced pretty quickly through the Angels system, uh, spent the 96 season, uh, the majority of it with the big league team. Um, and then the next year, uh, surprisingly, he was traded to the Padres um, in part of a trade for Ricky Henderson and uh, played with the Padres for a couple of years uh, before uh, landing in Japan for the 2000 season, which uh, in Japan, he became one of the fear, most feared sluggers in NPB pretty much right away. Um, he averaged over 30 home runs a year. Um, of course, in the, in the shorter seasons over there, very impressive. Um, he started out with Oryx with the Blue Wave, um, where got to mention he played alongside Ichiro, which I'm sure will come up today. Uh, hit 26 homers in, in a short, in 116 games that first year, so made a big impact. Then the next year, hit 38 homers. Um, and then signed with the Tigers and continued to rake for a few more years. And I know we got some Tigers fans on here um, who will remember him and remember him fondly for the 03 season when he hit 38 homers um, and led the Tigers to the first Central League title since 85. Um, he uh, played in the Mexican League, played with Yamiuri a little bit and hung him up for good in uh, 06, I believe. Um, and now George, as you can say, as you can see, is still involved in the game. Uh, he now has a baseball facility in Tucson, um, which uh, I'd be curious. We'll, we'll hear a little bit about that later. I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you're up to today. Uh, but that's George's story. And once again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to have you on here. An honor to have you on Chatter Up. Well, I appreciate it. Again, that, that was <laughs> that was pretty good. You did your homework there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's um, a long form version. <laughs> no, that was impressive. So, you know, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited. To, uh, again, I like to share with you guys, you know, the stories I have and, and, and whatever questions you guys, you know, come up with. So happy Great. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'll start at the beginning of your professional career. So not many people can say that they were drafted three times in the MLB draft. Uh, why? Well, I guess my first question is, why did you say no the first two times and what was that process like going through that three times um well, it, it, coming out of college i had a great freshman year um i got i got drafted uh in the 21st round and the money they were offering me wasn't all that um so my advisor and i decided to go back to school uh, we thought that uh, it was in our best interest to you know to go back and you know Put up another good year but also get more credits towards my degree um and so with that being said i went back my sophomore year um had another great year um then i got drafted again but the caveat with this draft was i got drafted later uh in the 38th round and um what happened was i struggled in school didn't do too well so the so they knew that. So they knew that I was kind of out of options. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to get me at a low price. Um, and what happened was I turned that draft down and I had to go to summer school for, uh, I believe, eight weeks, six weeks. And I used to go eight in the morning to nine at night for, for wow. that period. Of time. And, and, and I had to do that in, in order to graduate so I can go play at the University of Arizona. So, you know, I buckled down and, and, and hit the books hard and that's exactly what I did. Wow. So 
the Angels picked you after uh, playing at the U of A. Um, and you, you know, you pretty methodically advanced through the system there. And then you get a shot in the big leagues at, you know, relatively young age, um, made an impression. And then all of a sudden you're traded. So what was your reaction when you heard that news? Well, let me rewind it before I answer that question. Uh -huh. um, I made it to the big leagues pretty quick. And I think the reason being was uh, in the off season in the minor leagues, I'd go play winter ball in Mexico. Um, and going in into spring training of 96, I was just fresh out of winter ball. We had went to the Caribbean World Series, which ended like at the end of January, beginning of February. So I was fresh going into spring training when everybody was just getting ready. So I did really well in spring training. And I think that um, because of that, they had no choice but to keep me. But in reality, I think I was still probably another year away. Um, but I went there. I didn't do well in the big leagues, uh, struggled a little bit. And that kind of put me on the ropes to, okay, maybe we're going to trade this guy and try to get some leverage off of him. Uh, then the following year, 97, is when they traded me for Ricky Henderson. And, and, and it's funny because I always tell all my friends that I got traded for a Hall of Famer. But I don't tell them that there was eight, ten other guys that got traded. In the yeah. <laughs> so that's just my story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, all of us are big baseball fans. We all know the phrase player to be named la la later. Yep. <laughs> Did that label ever, uh, I don't know, haunt you or bother you? Or was it, I don't know, I'm curious it, about that. It's, it's saddening because, you know, when you, your, your dream is to play in the big leagues, right? And so when you first get drafted by a team and you go play with them, we're so naive and young that we think, oh, this is going to be our team forever. And because we don't understand the business side of things. So getting traded and going to another team, I was really devastated uh, because I felt like I wasn't wanted. You know, I mean, I think that's our human nature when we get released or fired, uh, that we're not wanted. And, and, you know, lo and behold, I think, you know, with, with my advisor and my agent uh, coming in saying, hey, it's not that somebody doesn't, you know, want you. It's look at it as somebody does want you. Mm -hmm. So and that kind of cheered me up and, and allowed me to go play uh, for the Padres and, and do okay. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. And so, you know, you spent some time with the Padres, AAA, whatnot. You go to Japan. Can you talk us, talk us through, you know, that decision-making process? I think, you know, that's where things really picked up for you. But I'm sure at the time you weren't, you didn't know how it was going to turn out. Yeah. I mean, you don't know. I remember in 96 when I was with the Angels, um, Hashigawa, uh, was telling me that uh, his team wanted me, which was the Orc Blue Wave. And at the time, I wasn't interested in Japan because I was a, a top prospect and they weren't going to release me. Um, so when I got traded to the Padres, I had a couple great years in minor leagues. I got put on the, the World Series roster. Um, in the year 99, they gave me the job. Uh, second game into the season, I go sliding into second base, nearly tear my thumb off. And I was out for a month and a half. Uh, I tried to come back sooner um, because I knew that it was a big year for me and I wanted to do well. And, and unfortunately, I came back too soon and I didn't do too well and I struggled. So that led me to the year 2000 uh, in the offseason when Japan came calling again. Uh, and at that time, I think as minor leaguers, guys that get labeled as 4A players are the guys that are going up and down. And it can get frustrating sometimes. So at that time, when they came calling, I thought, you know what, why not go give this a shot? And uh, so making that decision to play in Japan was, was not a difficult decision. Um, it was pretty easy. I got tired of being a, a forward player, going up and down from the big leagues to the minor leagues. So it was a lot easier to make that decision. Got it. So you, you went into that uh, season with confidence about your decision. Um, and it was the right decision because things seemed to click for you right away. What was it? Was it just the chance? Was it something about the style of play over there? Um, what was it you think that allowed you to, to thrive right away and, and continuously? Well, I, I don't think, well, I, I guess to sit here and talk about what's, what's really thriving. I mean, I hit 26 home runs, but I hit what, 250 or 260. Um, uh, I mean, I went up there and I, and I put up 
power numbers. And I think I've done that my whole career, but it was difficult. Um, you know, I'm going into a foreign country, uh, trying to learn the, the dialects of the language, the food, the living, uh, the interpretation of language. It, it's very, very difficult for foreigners to go in there and do well. Um, and, and the reason being is because as foreigners here in the States, we're kind of treated like kings and, and we become arrogant, uh, egotistical sometimes. And then when we go to Japan, you see a lot of guys struggle because it's not American style, sort of, sort of speak, you know, in, in, in Japan, what I learned right away is it's Japanese style. And, um, and I, you know, and I accepted that culture and I accepted it. And that's why I think I had somewhat of some good success. You watch a lot of other guys, they, they don't accept it and they, and they fail. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting. I appreciate your honesty with that. So if, if in the beginning you, you know, if you felt like it was a struggle, um, did part of you just want to go back after that first year or? Um, no, because I'm a guy that doesn't like failure. I'm a guy that wants to persevere. Um, if I'm struggling, I, mean, I want to dig deep and find a way to get better. And, and, and that's been why I think I've had a good career is, you know, and, and, and I stress this to when I go give my talks to all the, all the kids I train um, and I tell them, listen, throughout my career, I've had about 6,000 at bats and, and I've had about 1,600 hits. And I ask them the question, what does that mean? Um, and they sit there and they're looking at me and I'm like, that means I failed over 4,000 times. Um, and my point and my message to them, it's, it's not that you fail, it's how you bounce back. You know, for me to fail that much, you know, over 4,000 times and still play for 14 years is pretty impressive. And, and I think it's all the way you look at it and, and, and put things in perspective. So I, I'm a guy that wants to get better in anything and everything, you know, whether it's playing golf or tennis or, or learning, you know, new language. I, I want to try to get better so I can, that's just something that's always been ingrained in me. Love it. That's great. Thank you. All right, we got a question from Ian. Ian, go ahead. Hello, George. Um, so you played with Ichiro and um, Tony Gwen, who are probably the greatest single hitters of all time. Can you talk about their preparation and just watching them and be key and watch them during games and like what made them so special? Yes, you know what? It, it's it's um, it, it has been a blessing for me. I got to experience both guys. Um, when you talk about superstars like that, you know, in, in baseball, we go through what we call, oh, he's in a zone, you know, for a week or two, you know, but those guys were in a zone for their whole career. Um, they made they made hitting look so easy and it was kind of quite frustrating to see each row hit because he made it look so easy. But there's no shortcut to being a good hitter. There's no shortcut to being great at what you do. And it takes a lot of lot of hard work and preparation. And and that's what they've done. You know, and, and you, you watch those guys and the way they carry themselves. You try to learn from them. Um, you know, sometimes it almost looks like it's too easy for them, but that's because of the hard work they put in. And I was blessed to to be in, you know, side by side with them. Um, and that's something that I preach to my kids. You know, the work and preparation that they've done is study videos. Um, just, you know, Ichiro, I remember Ichiro, when he got on the bus, had his headphones on. He was locked in. I mean, he was locked in the minute he got on that bus. And, um, you know, it's great because those are images that I remember. And those are images I try to put into my players and, and, and my kids uh, that play baseball and, and, and try to get them to understand of how to get. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about my dog barking there. Ian, thanks no. for that question. That's a good question. Um, I mean, if, while we're on topic of Ichiro, I mean, I, I think that we, we'd we have to, being, being who we are at Japan, but I got to ask a little more about him. He's a big deal in our world. Uh, I guess looking back at your you know time playing as his teammate, what are your kind of takeaways that when you think back at, at your time with him and, and what impression he made and, um, and also, did you think that he would go to the big leagues and, and did you expect him to have the type of success that he did? Well, 
I remember when I was with the Padres, he drove with Seattle. And, you know, the whole Japanese media was falling on. I'm like, who's this kid, you know? And I remember him hitting, hitting me a ball during spring training that got by me. And to this day, he calls it an error, and I always say it was a hit. <laughs> um, so when I went to Japan and I got to see him, I was like, okay, let me see what this kid's all about. Um, you know, obviously the media, all the attention he was getting, but he was so fun to watch. Um, he's one of those guys that it's all business. Um, I tell a story to this day. Um, I've never really seen somebody hit a ball off the dirt, a fork ball off the dirt, and keep it fair for, for a double you know, which he did. I mean, you know, you sit there, you just get frustrated because you're struggling over here with pitches and <laughs> he's making it look easy, you know? And, uh, but it, he's, it, it was a blessing to watch. Believe me. I mean, words can't describe how, how good these guys are and uh, how easy they made hitting look, you know, because hitting is not easy. Believe me. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, all right, so you're with the Oryx, and you go to the, the Tigers. Um, I like to dive in I have various questions about that experience. Um, the ballpark on my shirt, right? All of us, I mean, most of the people on this call have been to Koshien Stadium. So, and we all appreciate it from the fan experience and the historical experience. What was it like as a player? I tell you what, I mean, Oryx has a beautiful stadium. I mean, the green grass, it, you know, it, it was Americanized. It was a great place to hit. Um, you know, when I went to Hanshin, the all dirt, which I've never experienced in my career, um, was phenomenal because the history of Hanshin, the fans were phenomenal. Um, to see 55,000 balloons go up in the air was mind boggling. Um, to see the support that Hanshin Tigers get on the road is phenomenal. Um, and, and, and and players love that. Players love to have their fans support them because, again, this game isn't easy. But when you have your fans be behind you, they are the tenth player. And um, you know, again, it was it, it was a, a truly blessing to be part of that and to experience that. Got it. Yeah, that's good to hear. I'm glad that I'm glad you didn't say, "Oh man, as a player, it's you know." <laughs> I don't know. We have I think as a romanticized view as a fan, I'm, I'm glad that you agree for the most part as a player. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the 2003 season a little bit? Sure, it's a fun ride. Um, what made that team special or that, that season special? Well, I think what makes that team special is attitude is always reflected by leadership. Hoshin came in, um, you know, what a great man. What a great gentleman. He was a man to be feared. Um, you know, he put the fear in you, but he got the best out of you. And, and that was a great thing because that motivated us. And he put the right players in place that year and, and let us do our thing. And, and when you're having fun, you play relaxed, good things are going to happen. You know, when you're afraid to make mistakes and you're being fearful, you're going to limit your potential. I don't care who you are. It's just the way people are when it comes to, to stepping up in those big moments. Um, so in that year, it seems like we were all having fun. Why? Because we're winning. Winning is fun. You know, um, we didn't win all, all the time, but I think having the mindset of wanting to win is contagious. And if you get a whole locker room of young men wanting to win at all costs and playing hard, good things are going to happen. You know, um, there's some great teams on the other side, your opponents, you know, they got great organizations. Uh, they've been developed well, you know, um, but, uh, it, it's all in the preparation and a lot of it has to, you got to have some, some luck with it. And what I mean by luck is people not getting hurt, you know, or if people do get hurt, you having people step in and, and fill in their shoes. So, um, those are things that go unnoticed. Um, but you know, again, when you win and you're having fun for sure. Yeah, I bet. I bet. It's all, it's the eternal question is winning, create a fun you know, good chemistry and a fun time or is, or is it the other way around? But I think, I don't know, you can't even distinguish it. Do you have a thought on that? Well, I mean, if you start the first game of the season, you haven't won anything, right? So you got to go out there and have fun. I mean, and what I mean by fun is, is I think as a coach, because I've experienced coaching here and training kids, um, you try to prepare the kids. 
I mean, in, in order to gain confidence, I think it comes through preparation. And if you can go out there and prepare these kids and train them and then let the game be theirs and then go out there and, hey, go do what you do best. Um, yes, there's going to be times when they're going to struggle. I remember uh, in, in 99, I was struggling with the Padres and Bruce Bochy, he came up to me, put his arm around me in the outfield and says, let's go talk. And he has his arm around me. This is a manager, you know, he goes, hey, man, I'm going to give you a couple of days off. Relax. Don't think about nothing. You know, we need you. You know, and, and that, that, that spoke volumes, you know, that your manager can come over here and say, hey, man, you're right. You know, just relax. You're thinking too much, whatever. Um, I think those are the managers. I know I might be wired different, but you want to run through a wall for them, you know, because they care. And, and I don't think not one single person out there who plays a game or any sport is trying to fail. You know, yes, we get paid a lot of money and, and fans expect certain things, but we're still human, you know, and, and, and we're going to make mistakes. And, and but if we can learn to override that and we have other teammates picking each other up and let alone your coaching staff, man, who, who knows how far you're going to go. Good stuff. Thank you. I've got a couple of hands raised here. Charlie, uh, you're up next. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, George. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. Um, yeah, this isn't necessarily just limited to Japan, but anywhere for uh, baseball. From your perspective as a batter, um, what makes a great pitcher? I mean, what type of pitcher was the type that you didn't really look forward to facing? That's a good question, Charlie. Um, I, I think as a hitter, a pitcher that can hide the ball, um, a pitcher that can be um, can create a lot, can, can deceive you with pitch tunneling, making pitches look like one pitch and then they break off and be in a different pitch. Uh, we call that effective velocity, uh, pitching in tunnels. Uh, those are those are tough pitchers, you know, and, and, and when you face those type of pitchers, you have to game plan. I mean, you can't, for instance, um, you get a pitcher who throws a fastball slider curve change. You can't go up to the plate on the first pitch looking for all four pitches, you know, because it, the speed differential is different. Um, so you got, you got to go up there having a game plan. And it's kind of tough when you're facing pitchers for the first time and because they have the advantage. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they have. You don't know what their ball does. You don't know what arm will come in um, until you face them again. Um, so hitting is difficult. That's why it was fun to watch Ichiro and Tony Gwynn and guys like that who made it easy, you know. But um, game planning and hitting is, is, is huge. You know, you've got to learn how to game plan. I mean, technique's one thing, but guys at that level pretty much have good technique. You've got to learn how to game plan. Okay, thank you very much. That's an interesting that insight. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Good question, Charlie, thanks. <clears throat> All right, Michael, you're up next. Michael Leeds. Thank you. Um, I'm curious what the biggest adjustment you had to make in going to Japan was. Did you have to change, you, you're talking about game planning and the like, did you have to change uh, the way you approach things or um, adjust in any way what you were looking for as a player? A good question. Um, baseball is a game of adjustments. Um, I think the one thing that helped prepare me for Japan was playing in Mexico. In Mexico, they kind of pitch backwards. They, you know, in the States, what I mean by this is, is in the States, on hitters count, they come after you with fastballs. In Mexico and Japan, they'll throw you off-speed pitches, you know. Um, but Japan, being more technicians, uh, they hit their spots better. Uh, they can throw you four straight fork balls, you know. They have such good command. So what I had to learn was how to be disciplined. Um, and, and what I mean by that, again, is, is in Japan, when I was in a 2-0 count, I shouldn't be looking for fastball. I should be looking for a slider or a curveball. You know, it makes no sense to look for something I'm not going to get, right? So um, that took some adjustment. But again, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes you have to face a pitcher a couple of times just to get a, a better feed and, and a better understanding of where they're coming from. Um, but, uh, you know, again, the adjustments, your first year, there's, there's a lot of adjustments. Like I said, the culture, the living situation, the language barrier, you know, you want to, you want to be a great teammate. You want to be able to communicate with the players, but you just can't. And you got to go through your interpreter and you have to rely on them. And 
sometimes you got to ask, well, is, is a joke I'm saying really funny in Japanese or, or is what I'm trying to get across exactly what I meant, you know? So, um, but in that sense, there, there's a lot of adjustments that we have to make. Thanks, Michael. And, and that's perfect segue. Sean had a question too. Um, that yeah. is a perfect segue. Go ahead, Sean. Hi, George. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, along the lines of the uh, translator issue, I was wondering, do some of the other aspects of being a foreign player, did you have your own translator or did, did was a translator shared amongst the foreign players? And did the translator services extend to life outside of the ballpark? Uh, yes, we shared uh, interpreters. Um, yes, and they did extend outwards. I, you know, Japan's been really good with that because, you know, again, we're going into a foreign country. Uh, you know, I didn't even know what kind of milk to buy or what, where to shop. You know? So, you know, those are things you overlook. Um, right. But no, we, we've been blessed with great interpreters. Hmm. Uh, but we, we have to rely on them heavily. And, yeah. and But the organizations, both Oryx and, and Henshin Tigers and the Giants, have done a, a phenomenal job of easing that pain for us. You know, uh, again, it, it, and, and what the interpreters have done so well, um, it's their way. They have to get us to understand Japanese style, whether we like it or not. Um, we have to understand that, and, and and they did a really good job of expressing that to us. And sometimes the foreigners we didn't accept that, you know, and and we can be stubborn. You know, and, 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 and sometimes I think we were looked at judgmental or we're being disrespectful, but it's just sometimes we don't understand because we're so used to playing the game of baseball the way we played here, you know. Yeah. But no, we definitely relied on, on, on the interpreters for sure. <laughs> Can I ask a follow up question as well? Absolutely. I'm wondering what were some of the ways, another off field question, what were some of the ways that fans showed support? that surprised you or that you found humorous when you were playing in Japan? Um, well, I felt, <laughs> I saw a big difference when I was uh, with Oryx and then going to Hanshin. Um, obviously the popularity, um, Hanshin Tigers players are more popular and rightly so probably because of the tel television. So everywhere you go, you, you know, you see people, oh, Adios, son. You know, adios, son. You know, and, and and you're walking around like, like you're a celebrity or something, you know. And I'm like, guys, I'm human, you know. <laughs> uh, but the, the the one thing is 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 what I love about the Japanese culture is they're so nice. Uh, I remember uh, my wife losing my wife losing her wallet three times and it was returned to her with everything in it. You know, it's unheard of. You won't you won't do that here in the states. You know, walking into stores, you know. Uh, they're opening the door for you, telling you good morning, good afternoon, thank you for coming. And you don't see that here in the States. And and and, and to be truthful, I didn't realize after my first year in Japan, going back home, I didn't realize how rude we really are as Americans. Um, and, and, and to take that and compare it to the culture in Japan was was shocking, you know, and, and, and we are rude, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, that's the one thing I miss about Japan is how how sweet and nice everybody are. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Thanks, Sean. Uh, George, you mentioned, you know, we have to learn the Japanese way and, and some guys are a little <laughs> hard headed about it. What are, what were the things that were the hardest for you to accept or and for that matter, like the guys who you see who didn't, didn't think didn't work out for them over there. What are, what, what are those things that, that were the hardest to accept? Well, a couple of things. I think number one, spring training for being for two months, <laughs> you know, it, it's hard and you're doing all their, their type of stretching. It's a different dynamic stretch. I remember my first year getting there, walking down the hotel, going through our, our kitchen area. We'd have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and go out to the beach and do a little stretch for 10, 15 minutes. And then you walk back into in, in, to the lounge area and have your breakfast, you know? I mean, who does that? We don't do it in the States, you know? Uh, so that was very shocking. Um, there was, um, but I, I, I just know that um, I'm losing my train of thought. Can you repeat that question again? The, the, the hardest the, things to right? accept. The hardest oh. things to accept in, about the um, Japanese. Another thing is, is 
I, I guess, you know, the beginning of the game when somebody gets on first, you're bunning them right away. You know, they're playing for one run and, and instead of playing for big innings, um, taking infield every single day, you know, is wear and tear on your body, you know, which we hardly even do it here. We come to the field, take our hacks and do the things we have to do to get ready. But you have to, I remember, uh, I was tired one game with Tashi and I told my interpreter, man, I'm, I'm not, it's like almost I had a lie, like, I'm not feeling good, man. I'm not going to take and feel, <laughs> you know, just because I wanted to rest. Because when you play, you know, you, and with Hanshin, you go on that 22 day road trip. When Hanshin's having that uh, high school tournament, we're traveling everywhere and, and going from hotel to hotel. You know, sometimes you just want to just strap it on, you know, especially when you're struggling, you don't want to take it. You just want to go there. I'm thinking too much. I just want to play the game. Let me play the day. Let me take uh, infill off and, 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 and strap it on. And I remember times that I lay in the, in the training room, the coaches would come, hey, are you okay? Can you still play? Can you okay? <laughs> and so um, I, I know that was a big one, you know, taking infill every day, you know? Yeah, so yeah. That, was, that was Japanese style. Yeah. So how about the inverse of that question? Especially like now as you're coaching kids, like what are parts of the Jap Japanese game, you know, on the field or, um, you know, baseball specifically that, that you learn to appreciate that is unique to Japan and, and maybe that you even try to incorporate today? Work ethic. Work ethic is huge. The Japanese work so hard to hone their craft. Um, and, and that's my point to these kids is, is some kids are going to grow up to be 6'3", 6'4". Others are going to grow up to be 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, but my point to these kids is you don't, the baseball doesn't know how big you are. So you have to learn to create a tremendous work ethic. And, and I always used to see the Japanese, man, they work, especially in spring training. And, 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 and kudos to them and tip my hat off to them. And I was impressed, to be honest. I mean, spring training, these guys are working hard, you know? And, 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 and I sit there, I'm like, oh man, <laughs> do I got to do all of that, you know? But man, they, they, they have a tremendous, tremendous work ethic. Got it. Good stuff. Uh, William Kennedy, you're up next. Oh, make sure you unmute yourself. There you go. What was your favorite away trip? Was there a particular city, a particular stadium that you really liked visiting? Oh, Tokyo Dome. Hands down. Tokyo Dome was a great place for me to hit. You know, um, the ball carried. Uh, I didn't think it was too big. I remember hitting BP, and we're trying to hit the back of the lights. You know, left field, you know, that's always fun. It's always fun to go over there and, and pepper those big old marketing and advertising signs that are up there. Um, but yeah, that was, that was probably my favorite place to hit. Good question. Thanks, William. Uh, so what was it like being on, you know, those games between Hanshin and, and, and Yomiuri? Um, I guess you got a little glimpse of both sides. As a player, you know, I know the fans take it really seriously. What's it like as a player? Well, as, you know, as a player, I mean, obviously growing up, you, you want to play in, in the big leagues. But I think growing up, you, you start envisioning your hair and in, sorry, in your ear just saying, Georgie, Georgie, you know, because you want to be in those moments. And when you have that rivalry, those dreams, those, those things envisioned in your head, they, they're coming to fruition. You want to be that guy. You know, you want to beat up those teams. You want to go and do well. Um, that's everything you, you, you dream of when you grow up, you know? So it was fun. Um, and I think it just made it more intense when you played your rivalry. I mean, Henshin Tigers and the Giants, man, <laughs> those are great battles, you know? And, uh, you know, it, it's always a, a, a great great feeling to be in those situations for sure. Well, cool. yeah, that sounds fun. Uh, we have one, one person, uh, Jonathan, who couldn't join us, but he sent me a question. Um, he sent me a thorough question. He's actually doing a little bit of research on um, MLB tours to Japan. And he sent me this box score. I'll, I'll share it with you um, from when you played against um, the Yankees. Let's see if I got it here. Hold on. One second. There it is. I think I got so, one hit with a home run. So um, you had three hits. 
Oh, three hits. And a three-run homer, five RBI. You look at the other the other team here, Jeter, Matsui, A-Rod, Giambi, Gary Sheffield, Jorge Posada, oh. Kenny Lofton, uh, some pretty good players on that team. Um, and then there's, you know, he actually said, I'll show, show one more. Um, this is from the Japan Times. And you see who the, who the hero of that game was. Um, so he wanted to ask about, so you guys are coming off, John, this is from Jonathan, you guys are coming off um, the Japan series loss. Um, but then you, you, know, you beat the Yankees, which there is kind of a, a narrative of David versus Goliath. And there's a lot of pride, it seemed like, in, in beating the Yankees. And I think you uh, maybe tied the Rays, the, the Devil Rays. Um, what was that series like? Um, you know, what were your the memories of that? And, and was there like kind of a, a feeling on on your side to, to really prove yourself? Um, and did you view it as like a David versus Goliath type situation playing against that lineup? Absolutely. I mean, you know, you're trying to prove to them, hey, man, I can hit, you know. Um, you want to face the best as a hitter, you know. But um, sometimes when you're struggling, you don't want to face them. <laughs> Truth be told, you know. Um, but, yeah, no, no, it, having the Yankees come in, man, it, like, like I said, it, it's one of those things that I envisioned as a kid is, is hearing the fans cheering my name. And, and those are moments you create in your mind and that you hope they come into fruition. And, and you want to be in the spotlight. You want to be the guy batting in the bottom of the ninth inning, game on the line, you know. Um, I want to face the best team. I want to face the best pitcher. Um, you're not always going to win, but it's the mentality you have to create. Um, and, you know, I just happened to have a good game. And, and, and you know, the home run I hit was in Tokyo, you know. <laughs> it was in the dome. You know, that's why I love to hit there. Um, but I think you take that and, and, and the confidence playing in the Tokyo Dome, you know, it, it's all about confidence. You know, this, this, this game, this life, um, everything you do is about confidence and it's how you prepare for it. And believe me, there's times in this game where you, you, you lack that confidence. Um, you know, it, 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 it's tough, but, you know, it, it was definitely fun to play the Rays and the Yankees for sure. Well, cool. good stuff. Uh, Bob Abels has a question. Bob, you're up. Yeah, yeah, evening or, yeah, evening, I guess, still. For you, for you, but uh, you talked about the translators in J Japan being so good and uh, just uh, very helpful in your uh, transition to Japan. And I was just kind of curious, we have a lot of Spanish players that come to the U.S. in the major leagues, and there's probably a lot more than, than in Japan, so the cost would probably be more. But do you think those players would uh, adjust a lot better if they have translators provided. And then the next question is down in Mexico, and I, you probably speak Spanish, but did they provide translators to English players in Mexico, like in Japan? Just curious about that. Yeah, in Mexico, no, they didn't have translators. Um, but no, without a doubt, I mean, I think it's imperative to have translators. I mean, it, the game itself is hard to play in your la native language. You know, it, it's hard. It, it's difficult. There's a lot of obstacles that you over, you know, have to overcome, uh, let alone language barrier, you know, but sometimes it could be a good thing that you don't know what they're saying about you, you know, um, but I, I think that, as I stated earlier, is as a player, you want them to try to be as comfortable as possible um, so they can go out there and perform. Um, so I, I, I feel for those players that don't have uh, translators. I played with some of them. Uh, especially like when I played in Mexico, the Americans going into Mexico who didn't speak a, a, a lick of, of, of Spanish, you know, they get taken advantage of and you just don't want to see that happen. Um, but yeah, it, it does become very, very difficult for players who don't have it. And, you know, uh, I don't think, you know, while most of the coaches now in America are Latin, so, you know, there's teams out there that are putting coaches, uh, in that position for that very reason, you know? So um, it's definitely helpful to have translators for sure. And, and the one question I just thought of that I was gonna ask is uh, in Japan, who was the Japanese player that made you feel most at ease or welcomed you and just kind of uh, showed you around? Or do you remember? Um, there's a lot of them. 
you know, there, there's a lot of them uh, with Oryx Hills, you know, Igarashi, uh, Fuji-san, uh, Oshima-san, you know, Henshin Tigers, you know, there was Yama-san, Yano-san. Uh, you know, there, there was a lot of players that did that, you know, and, but I think first they're kind of slow to warm up to you because they want to know what type of character you are. You know, like I said, there's been, there's been thousands of uh, foreigners who go into Japan and struggle and cause problems. And so we're kind of, I, I believe we're kind of labeled going in that way, that we're all that way until we show otherwise. Um, and I think when you go out there and you prove yourself to be humble, uh, try to be a man of character and integrity and, and a man who's gonna accept their, their style of game, they're gonna open up more to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I'm just, it just brings up another question as far as uh, major leaguers versus Japan players. Who do you think, well, now you may be more of a star player when you go to Japan because there's a lot less of you. And in the major leagues, there's a lot more ja uh, Latin players. Do you think the major leaguers are more as accepting as the Japanese players or could they be more accepting? I think they could be more accepting. Um, I, I, you know, my first year in the big leagues in 96, when I won that job, um, I wasn't really supposed to be there. I was slated to go to AAA. So they brought in a veteran third baseman. And when I won that job, I felt as if some of those veterans didn't want me there, you know? Um, but then, you know, but then again, in, in, in 98, when they called me up to the World Series roster for the Padres, I lived with Ken Caminetti for two weeks. Kim Caminetti was a third baseman, a guy that I'm supposed to replace, you know? So uh, it speaks volumes to the kind of character he was, you know? Um, so I think it's just going to depend on the individual of these, of these people of how they treat guys. But I think in the U.S., you know, people are fighting for jobs. Um, and and um, it becomes, it, it can become, difficult at times when people don't accept you. Agree. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, Richard Geiwitz had a, a related question. Um, he, he's not on audio, so he sent it to me. So he's curious, like you'll see guys talking in the dugout, you know, Japanese guys, American guys, Latin guys. Uh, what's that communication like? Are, like, are the Japanese guys, like how, what portion of them know English or enough to really kind of welcome you in, I guess, vice versa. Um, you know, the, how, how many American guys are making an effort to be able to communicate with their teammates, um, obviously Spanish as well. Um, Richard is just curious about that dynamic, the interactions in the dugout, in the clubhouse. Well, uh, I, again, if you want to be accepted, I mean, you got to want to be able to want to learn. You want to fit in the culture. Um, and I think that's, in any in any in, in any baseball club you know you, you want to go out there you want to be a great teammate if you want to be a great teammate then try to act like them and try to be like them and, and try to let them know you care um so it was great you know me trying to speak japanese they're trying to speak to me in english and we're cracking jokes and sometimes some jokes don't don't translate and <laughs> that becomes even funnier um but you know it, it is fun you know when you guys trying to learn learn you know, trying to learn Japanese, you know, uh, they're trying to learn English. So um, I, I'm trying to remember the saying I used to say, uh, I forget what it is, Jeffy, but I used to walk around and say, man, I swing like a girl, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they, they used to get a kick out of that. You know, I used to say, male samase. I used to throw my bats on the ground and say, wake up, you know? So, um, and I think when you can do that and joke around and have fun like that, I think that's where it comes back of the team pulling together and, and, and having unity and having fun together, you know? It's kind of the bite, so to speak. Yeah. You got to buy it. Good stuff. Marty Keener, you're up next. Good to see you, Marty. Hey, Shane. George. How you doing? I'm hanging in there. You're looking good. <laughs> How you been? I'm gray on top. You're gray on the, on, on the chin. Yeah. Uh, these, these are highlights. <laughs> I see. They look good. Hey, listen. You, the guys are all interested in differences between Japanese and, and American ball. And when I'm asked, I, you know, I've of course have seen a lot of them. One of the things that I think is really different in Japanese ball, there's not a lot of it still, but you know, in Japan, 
corporal punishment, you know, beating players, hitting players is something you don't see in the States. And um, the guy that you gave a little bit of praise to earlier on, Hoshino, who's an interesting guy. I always call Hoshino a, a, a Mr. Jekyll and Hyde because when he's on NHK in his suit, you know, he's the perfect gentleman. But it seems when he puts a uniform on and gets in the field, you, you mentioned the players get scared. He was infamous when he was Chunichi's manager for beating the crap out of his players. Alonzo Powell saw a couple of guys that had to go to the hospital for stitches. Oh, wow. And, oh, yeah. And in fact, the reason Alonzo Powell got traded to the Tigers was that he called Hoshino on it and said the next time he hit one of his Japanese teammates that Hoshino was going to have to get an ambulance to go to the hospital. And two days later or three days later, Alonzo Powell got sh shipped off to the Tigers. Yeah. But anyhow, I was wondering, and also Robert Whiting accounts in a number of his publications where a, a Hanshin player under the stands was beaten merc merc mercilessly by Hoshino. And I was just wondering, do your time, you, you praise the guy, and I, I know those good parts, but did, yep. you see, did you see that dark side of him? Did you see him hit players? Um, yeah, uh, I've never seen him hit any player. Um, we used to call him a field goal kicker because where he used to sit in that second row, um, where he used to sit in that second row, where somebody made a mistake, he kicked that chair in the front, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did that for us. He did that with the Eagles, too. Yeah, yeah you know, so, but um, I've never, never experienced him hit anybody. Uh, and I can honestly say that I've only heard stories like what you said, um, but I've never witnessed that. Um, what I did witness was somebody with Oryx kicking one of their players on the way down because I think they missed a sign. And when he came in from the dugout, they're kicking him on the way down. And I got into it with the coach and telling them, you know, you don't be doing that to my players. And afterwards, I had a coach's meeting or actually we had a meeting and they're explaining to me the situation. And anyways, um, that was that, you know, it, it didn't happen again, but I did hear stories um, on things like that happening. You know, I found that hard to believe, but you know, it was true, you know, but I, in, in my honest opinion, not once did I ever see him do that. Yes. He brought fear in um, again. And I think it was probably because of that, but, I've never seen him do that, you know. I think the good thing is, is that corporal punishment and actually coaches, you know, managers, you know, punching, hitting players, it, you know, it's, it's gone down. It's, it hasn't yeah. disappeared. It hasn't just been, you know, Hoshino was the worst when he was youngest with the Dragons. Right. And I understand he was still doing some of it when he's with the Tigers. Yeah. By the time he got to be the Eagles manager, he wasn't hitting anybody anymore. But they knew that he used to. And he, yeah. they, he had, still had the bark. You know, and every, and the players were really scared of him. You know, they, they really ran scared. And, you know, as you say, that, that can help get the best out of some players. But I'm glad to see the, the you know, that kind of thing with hitting players. I, you know, totally something I'm against. And it's gotten less. Unfortunately, hasn't disappeared entirely. Yeah. And I, I think because through my experience of what I've learned and what I've seen, I think there's ways to motivate players. And I think that's a challenge for us coaches um, to dig deep and, and find out everybody's character and who they and who they are and what they're like um discipline uh and, and punishment are two different things um you know i wouldn't lay a hand on anybody what i would do is i take it as a challenge is okay if this kid is struggling then what can i do as a coach to do a better job at how preparing him you know and and i think that's always a challenge for us coaches and that's why i, I mentioned bochi uh the segment is he found ways you know he found ways to come and grab me and put his arm around me and say, hey, man, I'm going to give you some couple of days off. I need you to rest. You know who also did that, too, was Augie's son with the Oryx, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, so um, I was I was impressed with him. Um, you know, Terry Francona is another one that does that, you know? So, um, yes, I don't believe in, in, in doing that to, to players. Um, I think if you have to draw fear like that, I think we need to do a better job of finding ways to better ourselves as a, as a leader to find ways to motivate players. Agreed. Agreed entirely. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. And thanks for joining thanks, us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, Michael said, Michael Westface said that he, um, it's my understanding that it was a kinder Hoshino after his heart attack that retired him from Chunichi. So uh, maybe he, he doctor's orders, he got to lower that blood pressure a little bit. Well, he maybe. did. He, he well, did. Have, does it. 
yeah, he did have medical problems that slowed him down later on in life, obviously, and, and got him early. But he, you know, he always, when you talk about Hoshino, he's always described as being fiery. And I think yeah. it's, it yeah. is indeed, you know, indeed the way he was. He was fiery on, you know, um, on, on the field, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think people, you know, one thing I really stress with players is, is when they struggle, they tie it to their self-worth, you know, um, and I think that, and I'm not, I'm not speaking on Hoshino, so I have a great deal of respect for him, because I think me coaching over here, I see coaches go through these experiences of when their team's not winning, that they feel like they're terrible coaches. So they try to put fear in guys to get them to play better. Um, in, in essence, we got to do a better job, I think, of preparing our kids and finding ways to motivate them. Um, again, there's some guys you can, you can stroke. There's other guys you can push, you know, but I think that only comes with, with time and, 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 and building relationships with your players. Good stuff. Um, I'm, I found it interesting earlier, you mentioned that you thought playing in Mexico helped uh, prepared you for Japan. Cause when I was preparing for this episode, I was, I was going to ask you about comparing the two countries. Um, you, know, you played summer league and winter league in Mexico. Um, because I thought my guess was that there couldn't be two more different <laughs> baseball cultures. Um, but can you can talk a little bit more about comparing those two countries? I, all of us here on the call are really interested in international baseball in general. And, um, and I know that uh, you're of Mexican heritage too. So I'm, I'm curious how that played in and um, you know, what the connection was like family wise for you, if there was one. Uh, well, it was an easy transition for me because my parents are from Mexico. Um, but you know, the Latin community, uh, they play music in Puerto Rico, Dominican, and Mexico, they play music throughout the game, just like in Japan. You know, they got music and dancing, they're having fun. Uh, U.S. baseball, I think, is boring. You know, <laughs> it's not as entertaining as these other countries. Um, but Mexico helped prepare me in, 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 in essence of we're not being spoiled as we did in the States. Uh, there's a lot of things you have to do on your own. Um, on the field, you know, you're dealing with with guys who smoke, you know, J the Japanese and the Mexican players, they love to smoke. Uh, but you're also dealing with the way they, they attack hitters from a playing standpoint. Um, you know, they sometimes they don't challenge you, you know, and, and as a hitter, sometimes we call those guys sissy, man, challenge somebody. But at the end of the day, if we really look at it, at it it's really about getting you out, you know. And um, so from a mindset of, having plate discipline and, and, and game planning, that's how it kind of helped me for Japan. Cool, interesting stuff. Um, so I just talked uh, yesterday to Bob Fontaine Jr., um, the scout with the Angels who signed you. Um, and I'll do a shameless plug. He has a biography about him came out that I told him I'd help him promote. Um, Bob Fontaine's a legendary scout. And with that Angels team, like, you know, he drafted pretty much the whole O2 World Series team. And I know the Angels had a really good player development system, scouting system. Um, and I'll say it for Steve Akeda on the call, huge Angels fan. So I'll, this, this question is not to him, but can you just talk about that Angels era of, you know, that minor league system? And it seems like they had, you know, a really, no, they had things figured out, really impressive um, player development there. Yeah, no, I mean, again, I think, I think, you know, and, and I, I can't stress this enough. I was blessed to, to be with the angels and, and have uh, coaches that cared. I mean, Joe Madden was a hitting coach. Uh, Eddie Rodriguez was a defensive coach. And when they came in, when they did, um, you know, when I was in Lake house or, or, double A AA or triple A, they fly in and, and work with us hitters and, and defensively. And those guys made us work, you know, but at the same time, they, they put their arms around us and say, Hey man, we need you to work harder. We need you to do this. You know, we know you got skills, and, but this is what you got to do. And, and they help prepare us. And, and again, when you get a player feeling that they're going to run through a wall for you, you know? And, and, and I know that's the one thing that I've learned um, through, my life and my experiences, I try to pass that on to my kids, 
You know, I want to drive them. I want to push them. But hey, I know things aren't going to always be perfect, man. But this is where you got to learn to, to, to push forward. And, and that speaks volumes, you know. Um, I try to translate everything I learned pro ball to now, you know. I have a, an 18 new baseball team right now with high schoolers. I have 13 kids that committed to college on one team. Nine of them are, are D1 players. So, you know, it, it's taking everything that I've learned in the game and, and, and the coaches that have impacted my life and passing them on to these kids, you know, and, um, and none of it was done by, hey, I'm going to go punish somebody. No, it's all through discipline and getting them to understand the, the, the hard knocks of, of a baseball. You know, you got to grind it out. So the, the, the development is huge. You know, and, and, and I've been in front of coaches, Angels organization, the Padres. Um, development is huge, and that's where it's at. Somebody yeah. down there, somebody down there has got to get these players to believe. Yeah, yeah. So that, I, that's a good segue because I wanted to add, I mean, you've woven into pretty much all your answers, your references to the guys you're coaching today. Um, obviously, it's a it's a big, you know, it's this is your team and, uh, can you just talk about what it is that you have? Like you have a facility down there, you have a team. Um, I, I really appreciate how it seems like you really put a lot of thought and analysis into leadership and development. Um, so I want to hear more about your program. Yeah, so um, I have a baseball. It's twofold. I have an indoor batting cage facility where I train players. It's for profit. Um, then I have a nonprofit academy where we raise money and, and take these players and we take them to these tournaments. And, and get them in front of these college coaches. So my philosophy of, of development is this, it's called 3D coaching. It's a pyramid and the bottom tier of that pyramid, 85% of coaches are gonna, coach, are gonna coach the fundamentals, power, technique, cardiovascular. Everybody's gonna do that, whether right or wrong, they're teaching that. The next tier of that pyramid, 15% of coaches are coaching the psychological part, which means how do you motivate players? How do you steal confidence? Um, how do you talk to them about team cohesion? How about focus? And the top of that pyramid is coaching the heart of an athlete, their purpose, their identity, their self-worth. I have always focused on the two top tiers of that pyramid because the bottom is a guarantee. I'm going to teach them the fundamentals. But if I can teach them the two top tiers of that pyramid and have all my coaches do the same thing, these kids are going to develop and they're going to want to follow you and you're gonna put out a great product. And I've always believed that. I went through a certification for that. It works. It's been working with us in, in, in our academy with these young kids, getting them to college. I had one kid come through my academy who's the number one pick for the Pirates, you know, signed a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know how many kids have been through college through our program. So, you know, development is, is finding ways to touch the heart of an athlete. Then that's been my biggest goal. Amazing. What, what's the name of the facility and in, in your program? Uh, the facility is called Centerfield Baseball Academy. And my nonprofit is called Tucson Champs Academy. Got it. Good stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one more question from the chat here. Do you have any opinion of, of the MLB lockout and the labor situation? You, you know, in all honesty, I haven't been paying attention to that. <laughs> I've been just, you know, um, I got three kids. I'm over here doing my job and, and, and my academies. Um, you know, I, I just, I think the people that end up getting hurt, the fans, you know, um, hopefully they can come to an agreement pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. All right. We got Ian's got another question. Ian, go ahead. So let's like, work playing on a team, having a job in anything, you have like people you like and people you don't like. So like, who was your best teammate? And like, how did a, like a professional baseball team like deal with like maybe a bad teammate or someone with a negative attitude who would just make everybody just like, just like they just get really angry if they're like ever in a room like like, cause you're, you're living with that person more than you're living with your family. It's like, how does that work, work out? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, you got a locker room full of different personalities. Uh, not everybody's perfect. I mean, I look in the mirror and I see, you know, a guy who's, who's imperfect. Um, 
So you, you have to try to get along with everybody. And um, I think one thing that I've learned is if I had a, a, a stack of quarters and I piled them up and I had one quarter that's bent like this, and that being the guy that's a bad apple, well, I can put him on top of that stack and the team can carry him. But if you have two of those three guys in the team, it becomes very, very miserable. Um, but those case, those those are going to happen because some people are selfish and they only care about themselves. Um, you know, sometimes you just got to go in there and, and, and get them to open up. Um, but you get a lot of bad attitudes is when your your team is out there losing. I remember when I got traded from uh, the Angels to the Padres in '97, and the team I went to, I think we were in last place. And when I walked in that locker room, it was like segregated. You know, we had the African Americans on one side, the, the whites on another, and the Mexicans or the Latins on the other, and it was terrible. You know, and they were in last place, and coming in there, and we had to change the atmosphere, and we played some music. Um, we had this one guy, uh, Paul uh, Manhart, who's a pitcher now, I think in the big leagues, but he would play this one Chicago song, and he would start singing, and we would all start laughing. And lo and behold, we're all singing that song. And we carried that the last month of the season. Man, we had a great winning record, you know? So it, it, it's very difficult to have guys that are selfish um, individuals. But sometimes, you know, you got to do what's best um, and, and still go out there and try to have fun and, 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 you know, try to find a way to get all these guys to, you know, to do it. it, it, it it's a hard thing to do, you know, especially if you got three, four, five guys that are selfish. Good question. Like, yeah. Who was your ahead. favorite teammate or teammates? I'm sorry? You had your favorite teammate, teammates? Um, there was a lot of great teammates. Um, you know, when I was with, are you, are you talking about my whole career? Are you talking about just Japan or, or, or what? Any, anywhere. Um, yeah, you know, Todd Green was a, was a roommate of mine. Played with the Angels for a long time. Played with the Yankees, backup catcher. Um, real, really dear friend of mine, Derek White. He got to play with me at Hanshin Tigers for a couple of years. Uh, Greg Hansel is another one. Jeff Williams is another one. Uh, uh, Hiyama-san with Hanshin Tigers uh, was another one. Um, Yabu-san with, the, with, with Hanshin Tigers. Uh, Yano's locker was across from mine. We have Igarashi with Oryx, Fujisan, Taguchi, who's with Oryx. So there was a lot of, lot of great players. I mean, I, I just can't really pick, you know, five or ten, you know. And, and what I mean by, by great teammates is guys that I really got along with. You know, there's, there's other guys you talk to, but not guys that you hung out with. Thanks, Ian. Um, that reminds me, I, I wanted to ask – about Ken Cam and Eddie. Uh, when I, I was like a 12 year old Little League third baseman, when Ken Cam and Eddie was winning MVPs and being the most like badass guy in, in the National yeah. League, uh, I know he had his demons. Um, what was he like as a teammate on and, on and off the field? Well, phenomenal. I mean, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, who, who brings in their, their competition to live with them? Yeah. You know? Um, I have a great story about him. In, in 98, when I was uh, living with him, I had a Jeep. I had a, 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 I had a CJ7 Jeep. And he got on it. He goes, George, I got an engine for that Jeep. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because he, he used to have like race cars. And he was the type of guy that built big engines for cars. And that's what he loved to do. That was one of his passions. Um, I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, Cam. So we, two weeks later go by and he goes, Hey, I get the, the engine is at the shop. Go take your Jeep over there. I'm like, what are you talking about? I got a Jeep for you. I have a, I have an engine for your Jeep. Come on. Like you're crazy. Cam. what are you talking about? This George, just take your dumb Jeep to the shop over there. So I, I take my Jeep to the shop and lo and behold, it's a, it's a 350 small block. He ends up putting an engine in my Jeep and and when I went to go pick it up, there was a bill of $19,000. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, holy crap, I can't pay for this right now, you know? Uh, 
but he goes, don't worry. I, I, I got it taken care of. So he's just that type of guy, you know, of, of he welcomes me into his house. He, he loves to give. And, and that's what he did. You know, and yes, he had demons. And I think it was probably hard for him to say no sometimes, you know. Um, and I remember the following year when he went to Houston and I was with the Padres. Uh, I remember paying, paying him back for that for that uh, engine, you know. And I just said, thanks, Cam. I said, I really appreciate what you've done for me. You know, you've impacted my life on, and really taught me about giving. You know, it's not about receiving, but giving, you know. And, and he didn't want to accept that money, you know. But I told him, dude, I, I will not be able to sleep if you don't take this, this money. But that was the type of man he was. And, and um, I'll forever be grateful for the things he's, he, he's done for me. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. He he was my favorite player for two or three years there. And, and so I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And um, it's a tragic end, but I, I'm glad to hear about um, what type of guy he was. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so uh, the last question I have here, um, and then we'll wrap it up. So I know you got your program there, but what remains uh, baseball wise? Like what aspirations do you have? Do you have a few goals um, baseball wise? Well, I got hired part-time by the Tokyo Giants to be a scout. Uh, one of my aspirations is to be a full-time scout. I want to do whatever I can to, to help bring a uh, championship. Uh, you know, I, I want to I, I get back involved with Japan somehow, some way. Um, it's been a blessing. You know, my kids now are going to be in college. Uh, I've been offered several jobs uh, to go coach and, and professional, and I didn't want to do it because of my kids. Uh, but now that my last one is going to graduate this year, you know, I'm, I'm just praying that I can do something that uh, can either take me back to Japan or, or help me do things to make, you know, the teams better in Japan. So praying, praying on that. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's great to hear about the scouting job. Congratulations on that. And uh, I think um, speaking for everyone, we had, I think close to 40 people in total on the call today. And um, all of us are rooting for you. Um, and I think that we're all caught after hearing you talk. I think we're confident it's going to work out for you. Um, or it already has, but uh, what you said, I, I, we're rooting for you. And um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. It's just really a treat and appreciate you candidly answering all those questions and, and spending the time and um, really thoughtfully, uh, you know, listening to all our questions and, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's always fun to, to hear questions and, and, and try to share stories, you know, and reminisce about, you know, the times I've had it. You know, I know I'm a fan too when it comes to different sports, you know, you want to hear stories. And uh, again, thank you for having me. I wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you. Uh, everybody was on a call. Uh, you know, I really had a good time for sure. So thanks, Shane. You're welcome. All right. Well, take care, Georgia. You're welcome to sign off. Um, I will I'll keep stay on uh, for a few minutes if anyone wants to say hi. Uh, but everyone else, good seeing you. Thanks for joining Chatter Up, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Japan Ball's Chatter Up. For more content like this and other videos related to international baseball, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And to learn more about our international baseball tours and everything else Japan Ball has to offer, check out japanball.com and sign up for our newsletter there. Thank you, and I'll see you at the ballpark.